Hello, and welcome to the Sound on Sound podcast channel about electronic music and all things synth. I'm Rob Puricelli, and in this episode I talk to David Vorhaus of White Noise fame about his involvement with the Fairlight CMI during its early days, as well as the story behind his Kaleidophon ribbon controller invention and a very early sequencer called Maniac. Hi, uh, it's Rob Puricelli here, and um, I'm very fortunate to be in the studio that belongs to David Vorhaus here in, in North London. Thanks for having us. More We're, than welcome. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, because of my particular selfish interest in the Fairlight, just a few things about those early days. And the first of my questions is, how did you first come across the Fairlight CMI and, of course, Peter Vogel? Well... About 1979, 1980, I was asked to appear in the finals of the Electronic Musical Instrument Competition in Linz in Austria. They had this big international competition for the best electronic instrument. So I thought it sounds fun, went along to this thing, and that's where I met Peter. We both ended up with a prize <laughs> um, me for the Kaleidophone, Peter for Fairlight. But um, more to the point, we just became best friends. In fact, Peter came up to me and said, hey, we have a girlfriend in common. <laughs> My girlfriend who's in, in London, this Australian girl, was now his girlfriend in Australia. And it took off from there. I see. So that, that was when you first met Peter Vogel. It, that was your first experience of a Fairlight CMI. It was also the first time I'd ever seen so the, what happened the CMI. next? Yes, in fact, we used to call it the CMI yeah. because it was the only computer exactly. musical yeah. instrument in the world. So, David, the, the Fairlight that you have here in the studio, which is kind of tucked away in the corner there, and you've got the, the VDU in another corner of the room, if I'm not mistaken, that's the first Fairlight that came into the UK that you acquired through Peter Gabriel and, and the early Psycho systems. That's right. Yes, so this, this is the first one that ever left, left Australia. And, Yes, Peter Gabriel had this for a few weeks before me. I got it from him. He got a, another one. Brand spanking new one. <laughs> a white one. Yes. Because yours, yours is um, my, my, painted black, yeah. Yes, it was actually cream colour. Yes, that's right. Uh, Hospital and, beige. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And they just decided, <laughs> actually, now they're going to paint them white. Which, yeah. fortunately, meant that I, I could get it at factory costs as a <laughs> favour from Peter as we were kind of best friends at that point. Sure. Saved save me 15,000 quid. Mm -hmm. They weren't cheap toys. No, quite. I was about to buy a house <laughs> when I met Peter and decided to feel that like was more important. It's a common tale I've come across, and, yeah. And got that instead and used the Fairlight to make it a few albums which paid for a new house. So. It was a lot easier in those days, I think, to earn a living as a musician. So, uh, another question I want to ask you, and this is something that I've heard from, from Peter Vogel himself, was about the origin of the famous Orc 5 or Orc 2 stab, depending on which uh, side of the line you, you fall on. So, that was sampled from a recording of Stravinsky's Firebird Suite. Now, we had a conversation um, about Firebird and how that relates to White Noise and the track that's on the album. Yes. And it got me thinking. So Peter Vogel told me that he was demonstrating or showing you this, this CMI and he at random pulled this record out of a box and sampled it as a demonstration to you and that's how the sound originated. But I, I wanted to know, was that pure coincidence that he chose that record given your history with Stravinsky on the white noise up. What's your version of that story? Okay, no, Peter's got that wrong, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry. And he actually, you got the name wrong, because he sent that to me a few years ago, saying, which one is Orc 5? And I think it was Orc 3 that he had as Orc 5. Right. But, you know, you can't forget it. It's clearly what it is. But it's, it's only mine. Everybody attributes me to that. And it's, by the way, the most... I found out on Radio Soho that they were interviewing me that that's the most sampled sample yeah. uh, of all times, even more than anything James Brown has mm. done, who's known for being sampled. 
But it's only mine in the sense that I found it in Peter Vogel's record collection. Right. He actually wasn't even there. He was, he was at Fairlight, and I was waking up late, staying at his house. Um, hung around in his living room for a while before coming over. Just wanted to see how the sampling system worked. Mm -hmm. so, I just, so I took out that record, and I found the particular sample, um, and I put it on his Fairlight, and I sampled his record on his right. Fairlight. But, so in that sense, it's mine, but it wasn't mine or Peter's that matter, it was Stravinsky. Yeah, of course. So did you pick that record out of his collection because of your, your, your love of Stravinsky's Firebird Suite? Yes, yes. Okay, and then, because the other, the other thing is I've researched that, that sound and I've listened to multiple recordings, of, but it's uh, that particular recording that's right, isn't it? by the Philharmonia Orchestra that is the one that you hear. Which Philharmonia? Uh, the, 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 the one here in the UK. Uh, Was that? Yeah, the, the album is... London Philharmonia? Yeah, oh, uh, wow. it's, it's on EMI Classics for Pleasure, which was the division of Music for Pleasure, their EMI label. Oh. And I managed to find an actual copy of that well record. Well done! Which is, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it cost me a few quid, which was quite nice. But I, I then was able to sample that into a fair light that I have. Yes. And it was just like it was, I was having that, that moment that you had clearly yes. Yes. 40 years previously, which is but quite But you probably sampled it in 16-bit. No, this was on a, on a Series 2. So it was, it was, it was in 8-bit, yeah. 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 Um, I'd love to get that again and do it properly in 16-bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are 16-bit versions floating around, I'm sure. Are there? So, yeah, I'm sure there are. Oh. Must be. Um, so you've experienced this Fairlight in, in Linz. You've, you've gone to, to Australia. You've had that experience there. You then go on to pretty much exclusively work with the Fairlight on the KPM albums. How was that as an experience, just just using this one instrument? Was that born out of the creative restrictions of just using one instrument, allowing you to then really push? Or, yeah, you, yeah, you pretty well hit the nail on the head. You really have to learn how to use a compu computer, particularly in those days when they were very computer-like. Mm. They're so much more user-friendly, not just in the way uh, your, you know, your fingers work on the thing, but on the kind of sound you can get out of it. Um, mm. They kind of smooth the edges down. They weren't in those days. Uh, it's a bit like a, a VCS3. It's so yeah. unmusical. <laughs> and I, I thought I've really got to just force myself to stick to this and see what I can do with this instrument mm. rather than just... Otherwise, you'd end up doing everything with everything else. Yeah. And just... And so I... Uh, had a year to do an album, and I would say the first nine months was probably spent on how not to use a computer in an album. Um, so many things are so disappointing, but you do find how it can, in fact, be very rewarding. Mm. And I'm really pleased with the results of that album. Yes. Um, I th was that Sound Conjurer, I think? The Sound Conjurer and Sleight of Hand. Uh, so sorry, Sleight of Mind. Sleight of Mind, yeah, yeah. I forget which was the... It was the second thing I did for them mm -hmm. uh, for, after Warhouse Sound Experiments. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was all Fairlight. Yeah. No, nothing but a Fairlight. And a so one of the things that has always interested me, but you know, your association with D.D. Derbyshire and, 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 um, and Brian Hodgson in, in, in that... Uh, realm of the radiophonic workshop and that use of what was effectively primitive early sampling of, of, of using tape and then and, and messing around with it. You then obviously progressed to the Fairlight and did you see that as uh, an extension of, of that work and to follow on from that did what did Delia Derbyshire think or did she ever experience the Fairlight uh, and, and see it in as, a, as this new way of doing what she'd done in the past or was it because I've heard you say that she had a pretty much a big dislike of synthesizers. So, how did that? I'm afraid she didn't. She she wasn't around then by the time I got the Fairlight. Mm -hmm. um, Delia uh, was so good at making her own sounds just out of um, natural everyday things, and doing stuff with them. She'd become the master of that. Mm -hmm. But she was disappointed. Uh, with the first VCS3, which is the first electronic musical instrument almost in the world, actually. Bob Moog made the very first, mm. but this was the first in Europe. Um, and you, one had to put up with this period of disappointment in what you would like it to do, but it doesn't. Uh, 
because when you've already been making electronic music for a while and you know what you want, you know how to get things, you, you find the disappointment and you can't get things the old way. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think she ever really got over that. I see. Um, sadly, she came around for like some years after and I remember giving her a MIDI device, I think it was um, something like, yes, Roland D110, okay. which is a, a simple eight channels of MIDI, mm -hmm. and it's a perfect thing to kind of learn MIDI on and make a MIDI arrangement. And it doesn't replace great sounds. Um, some of the sounds are all right, and uh, as non-featured sounds, yeah. they'd work fine. But you still want to be able to do your unique things separately. But you do have to learn MIDI, which is a brilliant system. Yeah. And I still use it with the Kaleidophone mm -hmm. uh, as a control system, not to be confused with general MIDI, which is an abomination. Quite. And nothing to do with it. Right. But unfortunately, she, she never kind of made that effort to drop her old ways and learn the mm. new ways and then reapply. You know, once you've learned something new, you yeah. can still use. Because I've, I've seen and, and read interviews with um, other members of the Radiophonic Workshop when they got the Fairlight, and there was a kind of an epiphany moment where they realised this was a far easier way of creating some of the stuff they'd been using, tape loops and, and splicing, yeah. uh, and they took to that. But clearly, that wasn't a view shared by by all. No, even tape loops. Um, you uh, you know could make a tape loop uh, theoretically ninety minutes long. Yes, um, one point seven seconds or something. Yeah, on, and, and on yeah, I don't even know how one point. I I would sample it fourteen k. Yeah, which is on today's standards ridiculously low. It means six k yeah. is about as high as you can you can hear. Mm -hmm. With my old ears, that's about <laughs> as high as I go anyway. But um, and that was just over a second. Mm -hmm. So they must have been sampling it about. 10k or less. Yeah, yeah. it's really short. Yes. Um, and so yes, this, these things are limitations you have to put up. But they're, yeah. they're very good though for doing other things. They're brilliant for. Well, you know, that's why I feel particularly pleased with that second KPM album I did because mm -hmm. I, I think there's some really good tracks on yeah. it. That it still gets used a real lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that was all done with the Fairlight. Yeah. And, and, you know, you, you find the good things eventually. Right. Even when well, you find how many things you can't do. And it's the same <laughs> with just about anything. Um, VCS3 was certainly like that. And any new thing, like in the 80s, we were getting one instrument after another. All these new things coming along. And they'd all do amazing new things. But I found a real disappointment in practically anything. Because the other things, they'd always get something wrong. And you'd feel, why the hell didn't they do <laughs> this a sensible way, which stops you using it. So you end up needing about 16 instruments to just do a piece of music mm. that you should be able to do all as one. Yeah. So once the Fairlight became, or started to drift out of your, your workflow, so to speak, mm. where did your journey with sampling then go? Did you progress on to things like Akai samplers or Emu samplers or did you avoid sampling completely? Hey, what, what was your journey through sampling beyond the Fairlight? Um, God, I have to look at my rack <laughs> uh, to, to see. Okay, um, after the Fairlight, it was Profit 2000. Mm -hmm. Which is a nice 2002 example. 2002 plus uh, sequential circuits. And that would just do anything a Fairlight. Well, I like anything, because the say Fairlight did many other things as mm. well. It wasn't intended particularly for sampling. But this is a much better sampler and works with MIDI, which the Fairlight of didn't course. do. And MIDI was really yeah. useful because you could integrate that with all sorts of other things and mm -hmm. have your master score on one computer talking to as many different instruments as you like. And this was the sampler, 12-bit. Mm -hmm. And like the Fairlight, which took enormous trouble to get as clean as possible with 8-bits, mm -hmm. but 8-bits still is just not quite there. 12-bits, I thought was brilliant. Yeah. It really sounded like the real thing. In fact, this 12-bit sample is far better than a lot of 16-bit mm -hmm. machines that came along that didn't really use all the bits properly and had much too much noise. I think the theoretical highest you can get in the way of signal-to-noise with 12 bits is 72 
dB, mm -hmm. signal to noise, and this gets 68, which is yeah. almost perfection. Mm -hmm. Whereas most things would get 50 if you're lucky. And it adds a little character, doesn't it, as well? I had, I had a similar conversation yeah. with other people in the past where they've said that 16 bit is just too nice, that 14 or 12 gets you close enough, but still maintains a degree of character to the you know, sonic coloration, maybe, yeah. to the sound. I'd rather put in my own character than have it well, forced quite. upon you where you usually don't want the particular character. But, you know, you can do bit crunching if you need yeah, yeah. to after. But that was lovely. And actually, what's interesting was that always it takes a while for the media to catch up. Yes. And, uh, well, I had a fair like nobody heard of it and didn't know what it was. And it never really paid for itself. Um, by the time I had Profit and MIDI, I was starting to get a lot of really well-paid work. But it was because I had a fair light that they knew me Oh, he's got a Fairlight, he can do this. And sure. so I was getting jobs, which, in fact, the Fairlight couldn't do, and I could do with the Profit and MIDI. And sure. people all thought were well, well, wonderful, but thought it's because I've got a Fairlight. So it was almost like a, like a yeah. plaque on the wall to say, you know, you're, you own the Fairlight, therefore you must know what you're doing, you must be of a certain degree of quality. Yes. But in fact, yes. you were using other technology. That's right. Yeah. And it's because I had a fair light. In fact, it was, at this point, it was paying for itself about every yeah. three months. It was covering the cost of a fair light yeah. and r raking it in then, but not using the fair lights. You've been showing me earlier today your reactor uh, setup and um, the collider form. Could you just, for the, for the, the uninformed, could you just kind of tell us what a collider form is and what it does? Well, I guess it started out as a double bass, mm -hmm. uh, which was what I used to play. Um, it, it's got four strings and two and fourths apart originally, once upon a time. It's developed beyond my wildest dreams. But it started, I guess, about the time the VCS3 came out. And that is something everybody wanted to play tunes on it, and they came out with a keyboard for it. And a keyboard is the worst abomination <laughs> that you could possibly put on a synthesizer like the VCS3. Um, it will only play, you know, semitones apart. You can't bend things and swirl things and stuff. And with the strings, with a string instrument, you can vibrato and glide and bend and do all sorts of things, which make it interesting. Plus, VCS3s wouldn't stay in tune with a keyboard. so. I, I could gradually drift my hand the way the VCS3 was drifting and keep it in tune. Keep in tune. So originally, that's how it started. Kaleidophon eventually evolved into a MIDI controller, um, which could talk to anything. And now it exclusively goes into Maniac, which is a combination of many different instruments built all in with reactor, native instruments reactor, is this godsend to people that want to make uh, their own instruments because they're not satisfied with anything that exists. Um, so you literally can build your dreams and go far beyond. It has lead lines, bass lines, um, harmony, many different kinds of samplers, and they're all controlled just by your fingers mm -hmm. under the Kaleidophon. So the Maniac that you have built in Reactor is based on the original Maniac, which is this hardware analog sequencer that sits by our feet here as we speak. So what yes. what did that do, and how has the software expanded its capabilities? Well, that, which of course was long before Reactor um, was born, a hardware device came Immediately after Bob Moog actually had invented the very first sequencer, which uh, you probably know 
from Donna Summer's record, I yes. Feel Love. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. That's the sequencer, Bob Moe se sequencer. And I thought, beautiful idea. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if you could actually have multiple sequences that lock together? Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of Bob Moog's sequences cost 16,000 pounds. So half a dozen of them locked together, we're talking ridiculous money. But Johnny Sheriff, a good friend of mine, brilliant designer, a great drummer, and I were talking about how we would make a sequencer or a multiple sequencer. And after several months of design in our heads, we thought, let's go ahead and do it. They had CMOS chips and it should be possible. So we embarked on this piece of hardware, which would do the same as about half a dozen Moog sequences, but actually locked together, mm -hmm. so they could add and subtract from each other. Right. All voltage control, all analog, um, but will also control MIDI things, many different instruments at the same time. And um, this was, I guess, the beginning of sequencing, mm. is how it all started. And this is the, the very first Maniac. Actually, it's not quite the first Maniac. Right. Because Maniac, which by the way stands for Multiphasic Analog Interactive Chromatophonic Sequencer, Maniac Sequencer. Mm -hmm. But the first time the word maniac was used was in 1943 or 44 in Los Alamos, America. And it was a very secret, super powerful computer, the first com big computer ever made, just to make one calculation. That was to find the critical mass of uranium-235. Right. To find out how much uranium you needed to make an atom bomb. So in terms of your work now, um, what, what do you think of sampling nowadays? Because there is a, a, a huge marketplace for pre-sampled orchestras and guitars and drums yeah. and so on and so forth. Very little original sampling going on. What, what's your, your take on, on I, sampling in the I 21st? like to use everything. As I say, the, the, this thing then went to the uh, ASR. Yeah. Um, the EPS, mm -hmm. and I just got to getting this at Supernova, oh, yeah. um, Novation, when I discovered Reactor. Right. And Reactor was an epitome for me, mm -hmm. because instead of this feeling when you get something new and thinking, okay, it does what it says, but why don't they fix it properly? I could make my own stuff and do what I want with it. Mm -hmm. And with Reactor, you can just do anything. Anything you want, yeah. And so Maniac, which incorporates everything I want, I played a kaleidophone with it, which is just a controller, mm -hmm. using all the stuff in Maniac. And Maniac actually allows us both, Mike, my partner, the other half of White Noise, Mike Painter, uses about half of Maniac, and the other half I use the sampler. And anything you want, you can make. Mm -hmm. And the sound quality is superb on that. You know, it's, it does sampling not just with a plain old sampler. It has beat loop samplers. You can do really funky stuff with the rhythm, jumping in around, and it'll stay in time to beats, even though you're throwing them all over the place. It'll have really serious internal resampling that will allow you to get right inside a sound and mm -hmm. do interesting things. It'll shift formats and everything mm -hmm. as you want them to. And it'll do everything else. Sampling is just one thing it does. Sure. Um, so you can integrate that with everything else. And I really think the secret is the integration. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do just sampling sure. or just synthesizers, but why not have everything? And under the one string on a kaleidophone, I've got two different kind of samplers that reinforce each other, as most samplers do, but also do different types of things. Um, so you, it covers everything, as well as a lead and bass line, as well as four-part harmony with 16 oscillators that do quite amazing things. Mm. Um, all, all literally under each finger. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, indeed, <laughs> absolutely. So, last question. Um, is there a place for 
a fair light in the 21st century. I mean, I, we've, we've kind of come full circle, haven't we? It, it was one of the first computer-based musical instruments mm. that then had a sequencer. Nowadays, we, we, we now live back, back in the box. We can do oh, it, everything there. But the Fairlight, the Fairlight's character, its primitive nature, you know, is there, is there a place for it nowadays? Or have That's we a lost really that? difficult question to answer. Can I feel like I'm perhaps being disloyal to Peter <laughs> with my answer. Um, Peter Vogel, of course, we're talking about, mm -hmm. who invented the Fairlight. Yes. Um, I've really come to the conclusion that brand loyalty doesn't pay in electronic music. Sure. Companies that come along with one thing and they're wonderful, like EMS, VCS3, mm -hmm. Peter Vogel and the Fairlight, but other things come along that really do supersede. Mm. And a lot of the Fairlight sounds I still use, Yes. but I've um, imported them to, into, well, actually into Reactor, which I can't think of anything beyond. Mm. But who knows, you know? Indeed. Um, I'll be dead one day and the world will be different. I guess, I guess but, but maybe my motivation for that afraid. question was that you, nowadays, so many musicians that I speak to have huge sample libraries. They have piles of, of drives containing all sorts of uh, brilliant and, and deep sample libraries that have been created by a company such as Spitfire Audio or something mm. like that. Um, and what seems to have been lost, although it hasn't been completely lost, thankfully, is that art of creating new, unheard sounds, the likes of uh, maybe yourself, mm. Peter Gabriel, uh, and those early pioneers of sampling who, who went out and smashed television sets or threw That's things it. down guttering to, to get sounds and rhythms. And that seems to, in my opinion, seems to have been lost That's right. over the, over and the I'll years. I'll tell you the what they're losing out on then, because it's quite true, there are all these amazing um, sample libraries you can get, and they do sound like motion pictures, but they all sound more or less the same. Yeah. And this is something that's happened uh, as music's progressed. We can get very polished stuff, but everybody sounds like everybody else. Mm -hmm. Vocalists too. Um, it's a shame that there's so many new techniques around, and yet, People all sound the same. Use auto tune mm -hmm. on something to tune a voice. It, it does what it says it does, but it it get, has its own sound. So all, particularly female vocalists, are replaceable yeah. by other vocalists. They you can't tell one from another. It's actually the sound of auto tune, and it's very much that way with sample libraries. They all sound the same, and they all sound like a standard motion picture, mm. and those end up generally being the sort of has-beens mm -hmm. because people think, yes, it sounds like a proper motion picture like all the other motion pictures. Serious top directors don't want to sound like all the, the last years and the year before's directors. They want to come up with something new. Yeah. And exactly the same applies in music. If you want to be you or somebody special, something unique, you've got to make unique sounds. Yes. And so you're not going to make anything unique if you're using standard libraries. You're going to be like everybody else. That's, yeah. that's the point. I was really interested to hear the, the soundtrack of a, a TV show recently, which was, uh, was called Chernobyl, about the, uh, the, the nuclear disaster that happened there. And oh, wow. the, the composer actually travelled out to Chernobyl and sampled elements of the town. So, you know, she was banging on yes, yes. brickwork and right. pipe work and sampling That's right. noises. That's and then went it. back and created this soundtrack yes. which was of the place. And and for me that that is the true essence of, of sampling. Even though Peter Vogel had created digital sampling to work around that problem of, of not being able to recreate <coughs> natural acoustic instruments electronically, it was a cheat. And he would you know he ad admits to that. Um, but it was that that use of yes. um, sampling as a, a tool to create the previously unheard that I think we're, we're missing greatly still today. It, and it wasn't really cheating because he'd accidentally discovered a whole new way of making sound. Quite, yeah. And it's not, in fact, necessarily exactly the original sound yeah. because it, has its, it does things to the sound. And, you, and, of course, the interesting thing with samples is to take them further yes. and do things with them. You know, mm. the, the looping, the distorting, the, the way you can play with them is, is amazing. But it's doing your own thing, not stuff out of the box. Yeah. 
that's going to get, you're going to get known for something, uh, even if you happen to have a, a hit with something um, which is out of the box, uh, how are you going to get another one? Because yeah. it's a hit just like all the other hits and it will be forgotten like everything else and there's no tag on there to remind people it's so-and-so sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that's great. Thank you ever so much. Really appreciate your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening and be sure to check out the show notes page for this episode where you'll find further information along with web links and details of all the other episodes. And just before you go, let me point you to the soundonsound.com forward slash podcast website page where you can explore what's playing on the other channels. I'm Rob Pericelli and this has been a failed Muso production for Sound on Sound. Thank you.